and we are back. Back with Kit O'Connell of KitOConnell.com. I am your host, Jake Fox, and we are broadcasting on 1040 AM, 92.1 FM, WYSL in Rochester, New York. Unfortunately, not on World News Radio. Today, right now, as the site is being fixed for maintenance, but we are live over terrestrial radio, which is, you know, it's, it's fine, whatever, you know, it's, terrestrial radio is still a medium that people listen to radio on, you know, um, it works, um, but we're back here with Kit O'Connell of KitOConnell.com, he has a bunch of great articles we're going to be talking about today, Kit is always up to great work. And that's why we have him on the show, because he is a truth-telling journalist. Thanks for coming on, Kit. It's always fun to be here. Thanks, Jake. And we're going to lead off here with Relax, Parents. I mean, we just had Halloween yesterday. It's an appropriate, an appropriate article. Relax, Parents. There's no CBD candy in your kid's trick-or-treat bag. This Halloween season, some members of the media seem intent on playing a cruel trick on CBD oil users and parents. What is this crap about, Kit? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, this story seemed to kind of appear out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, it's funny, we were talking before we got on the, uh, just like privately with each other before I got on the air about the police unions and the prison unions, because their lobbying is one of the major reasons that cannabis is still illegal. Uh, they lobby, they put a lot of money into making sure that cannabis stays illegal because, of course, they profit off of all the people they put in jail and all the property they seize from them through asset forfeiture. And so the cops have been telling stories to the media, and the media, unfortunately, in many cases, repeats them without really questioning. And the media loves a big scare. You know, think of the children as one of the most compelling things. It's almost a joke, right? You know, new menace that could hurt your kids. Tune in at 10 to see what we're talking about. It's like the old joke about TV. Well, it's brought online, and now they know that fear generates clicks. And so you've probably seen there have been, you know, almost a dozen stories I know um, uh, uh, about this that have headlines like, candy that could make your kids high is a risk this Halloween. And it's all garbage. Uh and what's really weird is that they've fixated on uh, a specific type of candy that is made from a form of cannabis, but uh, it only has, there are these, you know, uh, gummies, for example, is one of the most common forms. There's gummy candies that are infused with uh, CBD, which is a, a, a chemical from the cannabis plant, but it's not the one that actually makes you high. So right off, these headlines are wrong. CBD does not make you high. THC makes you high. And these candies, these CBD candies, have zero percent THC. Now you can go to a legal marijuana state like uh, Nevada or Washington, and you can buy candies that have THC that will get you high if you eat these candies. But what these articles are talking about is uh, CBD candies, and what we found is like thousands of people are taking CBD, sometimes in candies or vapes or tinctures, and they're taking that for it helps all kinds of things, even though it doesn't make you high. It still can ease anxiety. It can help people sleep. Uh, it basically does a whole lot of things that kind of balance out the human body that they're finding out. It eases pain. Uh, it can reduce inflammation. Uh, even some athletes are able to use it now because it just got taken off of the, uh, you know, the doping list of, like, chemicals you're not allowed to take as an athlete. Um, so it's a really beneficial chemical. And these stories are just trying to generate baseless fear. If you look at them, there's never any actual proof that any kids got a hold of these CBD candies. They're just based off the fact that there are candies and kids like candy. But you know what? Grown-ups like candy, too. I take gummy vitamins every day, and those aren't for kids. Those are adult gummy vitamins because grown-up people like candy. And CBD helps a lot of people, and people actually seek it out in a lot of ways specifically because it doesn't get them high. If they have a chronic pain condition, I just heard from a reporter the other day, obviously I won't name their name, but they told me, look, you know, I work a long day in the newsroom. I don't want to smoke pot and, and lose my edge, but I'm in pain all day. And so CBD is something they're investigating and hopefully help them. That's the reason that a lot of people have sought this out. And here's the other thing, though. These candies, they're not, you know, they're not cheap. You can buy five pounds of gummy bears of just regular gummies on Amazon for like five bucks. But 
five bucks will get you like two of these candies. Like you buy for like 30 bucks, you get maybe 15 of them or something. You know, no one is just going to give these out to people as a joke. No one is slipping them into, into, into candy bags. But this story still tried to generate fear just about the fact that they're shaped like candy and they have something that people misunderstand. And a lot of police, knowing that this is, you know, their livelihood to some extent depends on the war on drugs, they know that this is a lever that they can push because parents are afraid. They don't understand something, so they'll believe whatever they're told. Yeah, like this, this, this headline from WRAL in North Carolina, authorities concerned about candy that could get kids high. You know, it's this... Uh... In that article, they talked to a state police officer, and his only evidence is that a local head shop he visited was sold out of CBD lollipops. So there's no evidence that they ended up <laughs> in kids' hands. All he knows is that some grown-up bought a bunch of CBD lollipops, which, again... Those are fully legal to buy in the U.S. That's something to really emphasize. Under, you know, imports, based on, on various court cases, it's legal to import CBD. And what's really important, there a lot of stuff that people are taking is U.S. grown, and that's legal to buy under the terms of the 2014 Farm Act. So even though THC-containing uh, cannabis derivatives are not legal in every state, only about half the states have some sort of cannabis legality, whether it's medical or recreational, but all 50 states, consumers can buy CBD products legally and see if they help them. And, and, and so uh, it's just it's something that's widely available. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's just ridiculous, this idea that, that, you know, someone out there went out and bought, you know, bought out their local head shop out of lollipops, and now there's a story in the local media about how it's all going to end up in kids' hands. They're not going to end up in kids' hands. Somebody's taking them for their arthritis. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not. I don't think this sort of thing is ever going to stop until prohibition is is over with. But uh, you know, until then, we're going to be uh, we're, me and kid will be talking about weird stories like this. <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> but uh, on to the next article: reclaim your online privacy. Alternatives to Facebook, Twitter, and Google. Imagine a police state so bent on repressing dissent that people were targeted by the government just for visiting a page, a web page, or liking a page on Facebook. Yeah, this, I mean, this is an interesting subject to, to not only me, but to a lot of people who, you know, want, want a degree of online privacy they don't feel they have. You know, well, what are some of these alternatives, Kit? Sure, and just to, you know, just to add what you're describing, where <clears throat> that dystopian state, of course, is the USA. You know, there have been multiple attempts that, fortunately, so far, have been shot down in court, <clears throat> but the Trump administration has been trying to get a hold of, uh, there was one case where they wanted the IP address of everyone who had visited a website about protesting uh, January 20th, which was his inauguration, of course, the big protest in D.C., and another attempt that got shot down, they wanted information about everybody who had liked the Facebook page about that topic of protesting uh, uh, Donald Trump on January 20th. And this is part of a repressive uh, pattern, something I want to emphasize before I get into these alternatives. There are almost 200 people that face individually each about 70 years in prison just because they were at the protest on January tw uh, 20th. They're facing conspiracy charges, federal conspiracy charges. So people should look that up. It's really disturbing. And they're, you know, and, and they're expanding that to try to even go after just anyone online that was interested in these protests. And we don't know what they intend to do with that information if they get it. As I said, fortunately, they haven't been able to get everything they wanted yet. But it shows that this government is just becoming more repressive. And while I'm no you know, fan of, of Trump, of course, a lot of this kind of mass surveillance began under the Obama administration as well. So this isn't completely brand new. They're just using the tools in new and disturbing ways. Um, and, you know, something I've talked about, I think, before in this program is this concept of threat modeling, which is just a concept that says, you know, you're like asking yourself, what do I want to protect, in this case, my online privacy, and how bad do my enemies, like hackers or the government or police, want to get at my information? And, you know, the fact is that they're absolutely determined to get our information. They're probably going to get it. Um, so the tips that I have in this article aren't necessarily going to lock yourself up, like, like uh, Fort Knox, but even taking small steps 
can add a measure of privacy and at least make them work a little bit harder to get at our information. Um, one of the most important things, or one of the easiest things, really, that we recommended in this article, me and my co-author, uh, Eleanor Goldfield, uh, this is, uh, was switching from using Google for searches. Um, you know, Google just keeps a record of everything uh, that you've looked at. If you use voice chat, of course, it's keeping a recording of, of voice, not just what you're asking, but usually it'll record a few seconds before and after. Um, and you can go into Google. Uh, they've got a page, like a security page, well, you can see all the data it has stored at you, on you and delete that. And so you should definitely go do that. And one of the good alternatives for searching is this website called DuckDuckGo, sort of like DuckDuckGoose, but it's just DuckDuckGo.com. And you can uh, add that to your browser as your search. Uh, if you go to the website, it'll teach you how to do that. You can add an app on your phone that makes it really simple to search there instead of searching with Google. And the major difference is DuckDuckGo doesn't keep any records or logs of your searches. Um, and, you know, there might be a small inconvenience there and that you don't have that infinite history of everything. But that also means that the police don't have that if they subpoena you. The government doesn't have that. And Google themselves don't have that, which, of course, means they can't sell it to all these advertisers. Um, so that's a really great option. We recommend DuckDuckGo. Um, it's also really important just to uh, start looking for other alternatives where you can. Um, social media, of course, is a little bit more challenging. You know, we all have our, our relatives on social media. Um, there is this alternate social network called Mastodon that some people are exploring, uh, and that has some advantages over, like, it's sort of like a Twitter replacement but it allows more control over sort of the community environment. So instead of everything being on one website, Twitter.com, it's kind of on a network of decentralized miniature social networks that are all connected up to each other. And what that means is if one of those miniature networks gets overrun by trolls or Nazis or something, it could be cut off or filtered from this other one if you wanted to or not. Each little network gets to make their choice about what they do. And so it allows a lot of user control. So Mastodon is an interesting option. Uh, another good option for uh, email, something we recommend if you want to replace Gmail, is to try this thing called ProtonMail, uh, which is it's free, although you can pay a fee to get some extra features. And it encrypts your, your mailbox. Uh, you, you log in with a username and password, but then you give it a second passphrase that actually unlocks your mailbox from encryption. And so that, uh, basically that uh, keeps your email really safe uh, from hackers at least. Uh, and uh, to some extent when it's traveling between uh, email boxes, although there's still vulnerability there. Um, another one I'll mention real quick is the app Signal, S-I-G-N-A-L, like sending up a smoke signal. Uh, and that's a really great uh, app that lets you do uh, text messages, uh, voice chat, even some simple like group chat and video chat, I think, as well. Recently, they added to it. Uh, and that's something that Edward Snowden says is a good option, even. So it's Edward Snowden approved. I always like to mention that. But it's a really simple app for just replacing your text messaging. If you get all your friends on there, you're making it much harder for your communications to be monitored. So with Mastodon, you know, how, how easy is it to navigate around and kind of join these <coughs> sort of uh, these mini... Uh, social media networks that, it, that it's made up of? I think it's pretty simple. If you're used to Twitter, it should be pretty simple to get started on it. There's a few new conventions where you're communicating like outside of your miniature network. You kind of need to type out someone's name, almost like an email address. But there's a website called joinmastodon.org, which is a pretty simple one to remember, joinmastodon.org. And that has videos, and it gives you... Um, you know, uh, a list of all these different miniature networks and if they specialize in something, because there's different sort of mini communities on some of them, like some of them are oriented toward a particular politics or just a certain, certain type of fandom. Um, and so, um, and so, so they have a list of these on Join Mastodon as well as the videos uh, that will that, kind of help you get started. But basically if you use Twitter and especially if you've ever used a thing called TweetDeck, you'll find it to be very, very familiar. Great. Um, yeah, people are definitely looking for for ways out of the spying grid. Thank you very much, Kit, for, for coming on the show today and sharing your information. Uh, everyone, I strongly encourage everyone go to K 
kitoconnell.com to find articles like this and much, much more. Kit is a great service to the activist community, and I highly suggest everyone go and you know drop a couple bucks in his Patreon. Support Kit. You know he's he's a working journalist and he needs your support. He's doing fantastic work. Thanks again, Kit, for coming on the show today. Thanks so much, and yeah, check out my Patreon. I got some cool giveaways this month if you join up. So thanks. I'll talk to you next month. Talk to you, Kit. And that was Kit O'Connell of KitOConnell.com. Next, we will be joined by Turd Ferguson of TFMetalsReport.com. Stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. <laughs>